you're live. All right, Phil. Oh, me? All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the HMGS Roundtable for, hosted by NoDiceNoGlory.com and, again, HMGS. We're joined today with Mark and Denver Walker of Flying Pigs Games and Tiny Battle Publishing. Guys, go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Mark Walker. I'm Denver Walker. I'm his daughter. And uh, I own a couple of game companies, Flying Pig Games and uh, Tiny Battle Publishing. Denver does the social media for Tiny Battle Publishing um, and is currently uh, getting a doctorate in music. And um, yeah, she also does demos and sales at conventions. And I design and publish and wash bottles and a little bit of everything. <laughs> it's being well rounded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think to, to start us off, I'd be interested to hear, um, you're, you're a staple of the industry. You've been with a bunch of different firms over the time. Could you tell us a little bit about the genesis of, of Flying Pig? Well, um, sure, absolutely, yeah. In uh, 2013, um, well, timeline doesn't matter that much. I sold Lock and Load Publishing to David Heath in uh, around 2013 uh, with the idea that I would work with them for a while. And then when uh, in late 2014, uh, we terminated that uh, relationship and I started Flying Pig Games. Looking so more? No, 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 that's perfect. What I... The other thing I'd like to know about is when you started Flying Pig, what was what was your goal for what kind of games did you really want to put out from there? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, I, I could have gone into that. Um, <clears throat> Flying Pig games, I want them to be unique. And then I want every one of them. The, the purpose of Flying Pig games is not to try to put out 12 or 24 box games a year, as some companies do and great for them, no problem. Uh, but I wanted to put out fewer games, but games that made a bigger impact, that the art was perfect, that the game design was riveting, that the components were nicer and bigger. Bigger is one of the, the main things that I'm interested in than uh, other war game companies. So that was my vision. And uh, to put each one of our games on Kickstarter, I didn't want to go the P500 route. I'd done that with Lock and Load Publishing. It has its pros and cons. I think mainly it has cons. Uh, so I wanted to go with uh, the Kickstarter model. Yeah, terrific. You've had a, a bunch of successful Kickstarters. I know I've either participated or had friends who have participated in several of them. Um, not to hopefully out myself, but I realized I hadn't done the crowd ox for resistance until this morning. So I had to go ahead and get that done because, you know, they send you a lot of emails. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what is it like putting a game on Kickstarter? Like just what's, what's the process? Um, you know, it, uh, it's a long process. If you, if somebody just found, uh, sometimes I have a tough time figuring out the, the succinct way to answer these questions. Uh, to physically put a game on Kickstarter is not a big deal. It's like creating a website, um, basically, is what your Kickstarter page is. And somebody with little experience could probably do it in a day, day and a half, something like that. Um, but to do it right, to have professional videos like we do, uh, that takes somewhat longer to have the game at a completion point where you can uh, be showing people what the actual materials will look for, uh, look like. That takes longer still, but what really, really takes a long time is you have to build up a social media and newsletter presence that will allow you to publicize the Kickstarter. Uh, there, there are way too many people and a lot of them in the war game industry that want to publish their first war game and they'll come to me and they'll ask me, Mark, you know, what do I do? And I go, well, how many Twitter followers do you have? Uh, and they'll give me an answer similar to what's Twitter. 
uh, how many fans do you have on your Facebook page? Well, we just started it. We're going to start one next week. Uh, what kind of newsletter do you have? Um, well, we don't have a newsletter. And they think that these things, that people just put them on Kickstarter and they go viral. And that's not how it works at all. And, and you guys know that because you have a podcast and stuff. You have to work to build up these following. Um, it's something Denver does really well on the Tiny Battles side. Uh, she does a great job with the website. But all of us, myself, Denver, Eddie Carlson, uh, who works predominantly with marketing with Flying Pig, are constantly working at building an audience. And that's the key and the building block of Kickstarter is having an audience. Well, that, that absolutely makes sense to me. I can say for the tiny battle side, you guys have sold me games through social media. Um, I've been scrolling through and I'll see, you know, the, the one that I just purchased uh, and got to play a couple weeks ago was Lion of Malaya, which sure. you'd, you'd advertised about, hey, come check out the Burma, or sorry, the Malaya campaign, 1941, 1942. And that's one that I love that rarely ever gets gamed seriously other than as a very small portion in a very big theater. So I was, I was absolutely fascinated on that. Um, let me throw that, in. Oh, go ahead. Uh, let me let me throw in Mark. Phil and I work together. He's been talking about this game nonstop. So either I'm going to buy it or uh, I'm going to go to Phil's and play it. Hey, I'm really glad you like it. Uh, Arigio is one of my um, favorite designers. We don't work with a ton of designers. When you put both companies together, uh, the number of guys that we work with. Uh, routinely is probably about seven or eight, uh, but Arigio is one of them, and uh, he does a uh, he he's he has a doctorate in uh, a doctorate in war. I don't know. <laughs> Obviously, his, history, some um, yeah, foreign policy, yeah. yeah, and uh, he's very good at those operational games. Right now, he's working on a grand tactical game for us that's just simply called Black Horse. Yeah, I'd seen uh, you guys had posted the, the two covers, the, the Warsaw Pact cover and the NATO cover for it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would add for bonus points, I know some people were saying, well, you can't have the Warsaw Pact one and call it Black Horse. I would add that the Black Horse unit after the Cold War turned into the Op 4 unit at the National Training Center. So actually, it would be highly appropriate with that name. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. I did know that. I never thought that. Um, yeah, I, you know, I was also going to say, well, we could have a BMP on the cover and behind it could be a burning M1 and then you could name it Black Horse. That, that's true, too. I mean, those guys were going to they were going to take a pounding in that position. It was not going to be pleasant. But luckily, it's never going to happen now. So it's all cardboard. Nobody gets hurt. Yeah, and that's that's really one of the one of the nice things about wargaming is a way to to explore scenarios like that strictly with 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 no no blood and gore consequences in real life. Uh, before I go too far down that route, though, I wanted to cycle back for when you're pushing stuff on Tiny Battle Publishing specifically. Uh, so I guess it's a question for Denver since you do the social media there. Um, how do you choose what to advertise? Because you guys have so many different types of games. I've seen everything from modern combat to zombies to Cold War to World War II. It's a huge variety. How do you choose what makes the feed? Oh, gosh. Well, I don't think too hard about it. Um, it other than if something new has come out, then I definitely push that a little bit more. Um, and then I, I usually advertise the things on the front page, but then I will actually just go to our drop-down menu and just like the Lion of Malaya game, I had kind of forgotten about. <laughs> so I just was like, oh, I haven't posted about that in a while. And it's great to hear that that actually works. Um, and then sometimes I'll post things based on what my interests are that week. Um, like I really like posting about the sci-fi ones because I think 1950s sci-fi is really funny. So I like to post all of the 50 foot colossi or, you know, and all of those kind of things. So I'm not sure I think too hard about it unless sometimes I'll coordinate it with uh, like a historical event that's happening that I know. Um, and I'll try to like keep on theme with something that might be happening um, historically during that week. That absolutely memes, makes sense. I just think are funny. Sorry. I just think the memes are funny. So I try to, I try to just keep it lighthearted too, by throwing in a couple memes here and there. 
that's something that I think Denver does really well. There's a, uh, um, well, I don't know. Anyhow, there's a um, saying, so to speak, in social media that you're supposed to post 80% to help the people on your web page or entertain them and only 20% to sell. And Denver is very good at that. I mean, she posts the most hilarious war game memes I think that you'll find on Facebook from a war game company. Well, there's definitely some low-hanging fruit when it comes to war gamers. Because I, I, love, I love the industry, but it's sometimes we take ourselves so, or they take themselves so seriously that sometimes it's some low-hanging fruit when it comes to making fun of ourselves, you know? No, that's definitely true. And I, I think there's, uh, it is time to remember that, you know, the term game is there for a reason. Yes, it's a game about war, but it's still a game. It's something you want to be able to do for fun on the weekends with your friends, not necessarily something you want to have to leave understanding you've just briefed the president and the joint chiefs about how many people are going to die. Sure. Right. So you. definitely agree. It could use some more humor, uh, and it's nice to see that injected. So uh, I'd like to talk about some of the games you guys have, the, either some of the ones that are out or some of the ones that are coming out. So one that caught my attention a while back, and I don't have a copy, but I have had the chance to play it and really enjoyed it, was Armageddon War. Uh, mm -hmm. So what went into making Armageddon War, and why did you decide to do the unique face die? Um, I don't know. It depends on how far back you want me to take that. Um, Armageddon War uh, was designed by a good friend of mine, Greg Porter, uh, and then I developed it with Greg. Uh, Greg, I live in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I, I live a half mile from the nearest house on seven acres of land. Um, double wide for a post office. A double wide trailer for a post office. And Greg lives more remotely than I do. He lives on the top of a mountain in a castle tower and a yurt. Um, I'm not making any of this up either. Uh, he and his wife live up there. She's a vet. Greg's just a brilliant dude. Uh, so anyhow, he came to me way back when we test every week on lock and load publishing days, and he liked the world of war system. He goes, and let me take it one step further back. He's also a renowned role-playing game designer and other game designers. Armageddon War may be the first game that most war gamers are aware of that Greg's designed, but he's a veteran uh, game designer and knows a ton of people in the game design industry. So anyhow, he was testing with me with World at War, and he said, hey, I'd like to do one of these World at War modules, uh, but I'd like to take it to the present day. And I said, ah, oh, you know, Greg, it, it's kind of anchored in 1985. That's just when it takes place and he went, okay. So anyhow, when I started Flying Pig, he said, well, what about now? How about if I come up with a completely new design and take it into the near future? And that was the seed of, uh, that was the seed of why Armageddon War came to pass. Now I'm gonna turn around for a second and look at something on the shelf behind me. Then there was a game that came out I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it, called ARS Victor. Have you ever heard of it? I'm, I'm not familiar. Mitch, do you know it? I've never heard of it, but it sounds interesting. Okay, it's called the Two Hour War Game, and it has nothing to do with Ed Texiera's Two Hour War Game company. It's called the Two Hour War Game, and it's, it's a fictitious thing, and Greg and I played it for fun, and it has stamped dice. And Greg was just like, wow, I think that's such a great idea. Um, and so we brought it into Armageddon War, uh, which I think is very cool and fun. And then I also, something else I like about Armageddon War that's physically different than other games are the trapezoidal um, administrative markers that go under them, under the units rather than on top. And the whole idea behind that is that you got all this, all this trouble to make this beautiful game, and then all these units sit there with admin markers on top of them. So we said, why not put it, excuse me, under them? So that's kind of the history of Armageddon War. 
Well, I mean, I think visual visual display matters quite a bit, especially for for this industry. Because you are right, you spend a lot of money on you get talented artists to to draw something for you, and then you hide it. I remember uh, one of the games that uh, I believe you guys had advertised about robot tanks in the future. Um, you showed up and showed the play mats for what it looked like, and solicited audience feedback. And somebody had said, "I wish I could see the art more." Hmm. Could have been the hover. Yeah, would well, that? How long ago was this? This would have been quite a while ago. I don't. I haven't seen the game come to fruition yet. I would have to look it up. It might have been high speed uh, hover tank, um, which. Um, no, that's uh, what's his name that owns the other company now. Uh, anyhow, it'll come to me. Um, yeah. So it, it is actually, uh, it's from Tiny Battle, and it's a game called Solus. The picture was of an Ura-9 oh, sure, sure. robotic tank. Yes, that's going to be another Greg Porter design. Yeah. Yeah, we test it often again. Right now we're working on a design of his called Aiden. Uh, it's one of the things we test when we get together, plus a couple of things I'm working on. But yes, Solus will happen. It'll probably happen this year. Oh, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Um, unmanned vehicles are obviously very big in modern combat and especially basing off of, off of current ones is, is appealing to me. So in terms of other games that you guys have coming out this year, I'd like to talk for a moment about Resistance, which, uh, or La I'd Resistance. Um, so what was the, how did you get started? What made you think, I want to make a new game on the French Resistance? Because I'm aware of several out there, but I'm not aware of any that play as smooth as what you've made. This is um, it's really nice you to say that. Uh, it's a blast. Uh, I don't even know if I'm calling it a war game, but it, you know, maybe it is. Who cares? Uh, war theme. Yeah, it's war theme for sure. Um, here's how it came about. <clears throat> um, my middle daughter, Denver's younger sister, owns a after-school care program in Richmond. Uh, called Discovery Kids, and they have different people come in and talk to them. Hang with me. I'm, it, this actually is, uh, and so uh, she was going to have me come in and talk to them about game design. Okay, uh, we're not talking infants, but we're not talking 18-year-olds either. I mean, these are like, you know, 9, 10, 10-year-olds, 10 and, I, you know, I couldn't really see them picking up 65 and playing it, so I came up with a game uh, called uh, The Rescue of Queen Jan Jan, who is my wife. And it was this uh, game that you can play where people are, are coming to rescue Janice and there's very simple card play uh, fighting. Well, after we did that, um, both my daughter and Jessica and Jan said, you know, this was a lot of fun. Can you come up with another simple type card game, uh, mechanic type game? I said, yes. And you know, I love Kaiju. Do you guys, are y'all Kaiju fans? I, I am very much so. Not as much as my, my coworker, Doc, who I think knows more about Godzilla than anybody I've ever met, but I'm, I'm a fan. <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, I designed a game called Kaiju Summer. And uh, I chickened out uh, because I said, ah, you know, we all love it. This is great. This is super. But everybody that follows me is a war gamer. They'll never buy it. So we put Kaiju Summer into World War II and put them in a wearing blender, and it came out La Resistance. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. So yeah. one, one of the reasons the game appeals to me is uh, on, my, on my own personal social media account, I ask people from time to time, what stops you from getting into wargaming? Because I'm, for, for a record, I am a millennial. I'm 32. Uh, I have a lot of friends that will, no problem, give me four to six hours a day to play Dungeons & Dragons or Shadowrun right. or another role-playing right. game. And I've yeah. asked, like, why don't you guys want to play war games? It's a lot of the, the same stuff. It's a lot of the same mechanics. The abstraction borrows. The dice are the same. The art is complex as Dungeons and Dragons, would you say? De Denver's, Denver's a, a uh, DM. She's really good. But what did you say? 
Uh, I mean, I guess it just depends on how into it you want to be. I guess, like you always say, the thing with role-playing games is only one person really needs to know the rules to get started. And I guess you could say that about war games, but a lot of my friends will just say, can I do this? And I'll be like, yes, you can. So I, I guess there's this, it feels a little bit more like easy in that regard. We talk about this concept a lot, like why are war games unapproachable or all these things, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think there's any one answer. Uh, I think you're absolutely right that the facilitated nature of a role-playing game where you really, you can say you read the book, you know, you give a player a handout and do they ever really read the handout? Maybe. Uh, <laughs> but then they just ask you because you're, you're not just the, the adjudicator, you're also the facilitator. You're helping them tell their story and, and enjoy that. I think that's absolutely a point of it. The big thing that I come to though is when, I'm, when my friends talk to me, the two things they say is either I, I don't like the subject matter which for some people, they just don't like war. Okay, war games are probably not for you. I can't do anything about that. But the second category, which is a much larger category, they feel they're unapproachable because they feel they have a disadvantage against people that spend a lot of time with war games or a lot of time with history. Yeah. Uh, and I personally think this is a bit of a mistake because as I've pointed out, like the, the war game I think I've played the most, which is Vento Nuovo's Moscow 41, I have like a 33% win rate in it. I'm not very good. But mm -hmm. because I talk to people that they're like, well, Phil, you know, history, you know, you know, all this, you have a huge edge. So where I'm coming back around on this, I'm not trying to hijack your guys' interview and brag about myself here. Uh, to me, La Resistance is a, a way to get people in that like the subject, World War II, the French Resistance, things like that. And in a rule set that is not going to make them feel like if they don't know everything about the resistance, they're not going to have a good time. So I appreciated that aspect of the design that you don't need to go in knowing much other than you're fighting Nazis. Here you go. Yeah, it, and it's a fun game too. I mean, you can teach it in five, six minutes, something like that. And, um, and people pick it up really quickly. We're running a La Resistance uh, game event at Gen Con, Gen Con Online. Um, so we'll see how that goes. That's going to be next Friday at one o'clock. As a matter of fact, this afternoon after this uh, panel, Eddie Carlson and I were going to get together and and go through uh, using La Resistance on Tabletop Simulator. But uh, that's a long answer to. I think that that's a big deal. Uh, I, I think that that it's easy and that you don't uh, need to feel like you're an expert in history to play. It's also, when you're playing with one other person, I think that intimidation factor can come in. Like when I'm playing against, I mean, it's my dad, so I don't care as much, but you know, like he'll, he'll explain to me the history and I'll be like, wow, I wasn't even thinking about that. But when you're playing with four people, you're not the only one under fire, so to speak, when it comes <laughs> to like feeling like you're not, uh, I guess, adequate enough in your, you know, historical knowledge. Um, and I think that that's, thematically with the law res resistance being able to compete with each other is a really fun um, idea that could really only come through with that concept. I, I can't think of, I'm sure there are other situations where it would come through, but I think that that, that theme really helps that competitive aspect come through between multiple people. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree. And I think it helps when the history backs you up because you are right. If you play other games, sometimes where you have people competing internally amongst their side, you're sort of like, I don't know if this is how this really happened, but with the French resistance, absolutely. I mean, heck, before the invasion, half those guys were shooting at each other. So, and, and all the movies. There's so many great movies about the resistance, right? Oh, yeah. Are yeah. there? Oh, don't give them ideas. Okay. <laughs> They're going to be watching them tonight. Well, I mean, I, I would throw Casablanca in there, but... Uh, hey, so I do have a question. You... Uh, you know, I do follow you guys on social media. Mark, you've been throwing out a lot of teasers about something I'm very excited for. Um, What's that? Which is uh, The Long Road. Yeah. I'm very excited about that one. Um, if you have a few minutes, I'd love to hear about that, that game. And I think you our sure? audience would too. Am I sure that I want to hear Might about that? I like what you hear. Uh-oh. What's that? Well... Um, I'm just kind of kidding with you. I mean, okay. I, I'd be glad to tell you about the long road. Well, yeah, go for it. Go for it. Well, so um, the long road was birthed. Uh, well, heck, I guess it was really birthed as uh, sticks and stones, but it was birthed from uh, 
Platoon Commander Deluxe Kursk. But Greg and I have been testing it for two years. Um, and I've just been uh, tweaking it and doing little things here and there. So the heart of the system is the platoon commander system, but there's so many improvements. Uh, to me, it is so much richer. Uh, I, I just can't, you know, I can't wait to get it out to people. I enjoy every time I play tested it. We just made a couple of tweaks. A, a couple of things came to my mind uh, just like three weeks ago that I added in that I really like. And then uh, something else that, I, that I've done recently uh, as I was writing, the, uh, writing some of the uh, script for the Kickstarter video, uh, I just started thinking, you know, right that the game was a little bit generic. I mean, it was just like in in its stage, it was it was set. You know, it's just like pull the gap from Compass Games or World of War '85 from Lock and Load Publishing, or <clears throat> can't think of the name of the couple of the games from Thin Red Line. It's always it's the same stuff. It's uh, you know Russians crossing the line. Let's shoot them up. And I designed a third world war that was different from that. I, and I'm not getting down on those other three games. I want to be very clear about that. I, I think that that's great. It isn't uh, a me versus them thing at all. But I designed a world war that was different from that uh, in the original world at war and the novels that went with it and the dark war RPG. And, um, so I don't see a reason to put the long road in a generic world at war. So the long road will actually be in, in my world war three. It'll actually be in the dark war world. Uh, so there's going to be uh, some, paranormal surprises. there will be some paranormal surprises within the game and some uh, uniqueness to it which is something that really excites me. Yeah, I think that's, um, that, that's an interesting thing you bring up because there is a lot of room for that within broader wargaming for how do you get paranormal in, how do you get sort of other aspects that clearly a lot of consumers are really into. Um, full disclosure for everybody that's not aware, I have a published urban fantasy novel, so I feel one kind of way about this. Uh, but I feel like that... It, more exploration of that in war games is one of many ways to get a broader market in that might not otherwise look at it. So I think it's terrific you're taking a look at that. I think it's, I'm so excited about it, I can't tell you. I mean, the original World of War, um, the backstory from it, like if you ever pick up a World of War compendium and read the backstory, um, it was all there. Uh, in that particular game, it never so much um, was present on the battlefield, uh, but there will be instances in the long road where it's going to be present on the battlefield. The long road will have um, heroic counters. There are actually going to be three types, heroes, commanders, and uh, champions um, that will be there on the battlefield with platoons of T-80s and whatnot. And uh, for instance, commanders command tank platoons and they'll, they'll give them little bonuses, like they'll be slightly more accurate. Uh, maybe their armor will go up a little bit just because the commander is able to uh, spot better cover. Uh, heroes, um, although they're unique counter and can move by themselves, will usually hang out with infantry platoons where they will increase their firepower and they will have special abilities, not too unsimilar to World at War 65. Uh, they'll have special abilities that will enhance anything the hero does, but if it happens to be stacked with a platoon, also that platoon and champions will be heroes of, um, usually uh, they'll be paranormal type creatures 
uh, and they will also have special abilities and, and have attack and uh, uh, melee properties of their own also. Um, so it, it's going to it's going to be a neat juxtaposition of horror, so to speak. Nobody's going to get scared playing a game. I got you there, but horror and just a military simulation, kind of like military horror, the movie genre. Yeah, absolutely. I, again, I'm probably showing my own biases here, but one of my favorites was the the mid 2000s British military horror film, Dog Soldiers. Oh, which, heck uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course, the initial military horror that started them all off was Aliens, the one also with yes, the second one, and that was so awesome. Absolutely. So I um, want to make sure we get to talk about as much as possible from Flying Pig. So we got uh, Rich in the comments mentioning that he's the fans group admin for Old School Tactical. So let's talk about Old School Tactical for a bit. Love to. Well, I know you guys are, uh, I think you got three volumes out. I'm not 100% caught up, but I saw the Pacific one was the most recent, I believe, unless you got another one since then. No, no. Uh, the third volume, the Pacific, is the, um, is the latest one. Um, we're working on the fourth one. When I say we, I mean, it's kind of a one-man show except for uh, proofing and some of the scenario testing and whatnot. Uh, Shane's working on the fourth one, um, and it, um, anyhow, it, it'll, it'll be in a theater that we haven't covered yet, uh, but is, is fairly popular with war gamers, and yeah, so Old School Tactical is just uh, one of our bread and butters. It's a great squad level game, and uh, Shane is one of the best people in the world to work with. We all get together and game every time we go to WBC with Shane and his sister Kelly and Denver and I and yeah. So I have it. It came. It is, you know, you're underselling it, Mark. And it's just like the rest of your flying pig games. The the artwork is beautiful. The counters are the larger counters. It is aesthetically an amazing game, but the rules the way you guys took your existing game in the um, European theater and moved it over with some rule tweaks and changes to the Pacific, I just think that it is that better than the, uh, the other volumes because it's, it's fresh, it's new. I really am, I have been enjoying it so far. Well, thanks. You know, I think it's fresh too, but those ideas, it isn't, it isn't a they thing. It's a shame thing. I mean, Shane came up with those ideas. Uh, Greg and I did a good amount of testing. I want to say we tested about eight scenarios. Um, so yeah, we gave Shane some ideas and, and, and some tweaks and of course some scenario balancing, but the initial ideas for this stuff for volume three were all Shane and he did a great job with it. So Rich is asking in the comments, uh, he's, he's hoping he can get some hints on the new old school tactical game. Do you have, uh, have anything you want to want to tease out? It'll be somewhere around Sicily. Yeah. All right. All right. I'm going to assume that means it's, uh, huh, where, where could that be? Hopefully that works for you, Rich. So, in talking about uh, all the games you have from both of these companies, both of which are very different, if you were going to try to sell somebody on their first war game, which of your titles would you try to sell? Them? Oh, wow. Uh, wow. Mm. I don't know. If you have an idea, go ahead. Um. Uh, I play a lot. Well, I don't play a lot, but I have introduced a few of my friends to Old School Tactical Volume 2, actually. So as long as you start with a, a, yeah, a small a scenario that just starts with a small portion of the map and just uh, keep it pretty simple. Sometimes I don't even play with tank, just to kind of get them used to um, infantry combat, I guess. And then I try to actually, I like to add in our our Eddie Carlson, who works for us. He's so good. He comes from the D and D world, but now is like the most wealthy board gamer in the world. He does such a good job of making it feel immersive. Like he adds this narrative component to playing war games, and it's so funny. 
like every lieutenant, he, he'll say like, you know, this guy is lactose intolerant. You got to feel sorry <laughs> for him. And so he adds all this stuff to it that makes it really fun. Um, but I think I would maybe start with like Night of Man or I think Night of Man is a good transition because thematically a lot of people might come to sci-fi before they come to the historical games. And then you can show them that play and then move to 65. And then that helps teach them some of the vocabulary that I think is so inundating for new war gamers uh, or at least it was for me a lot of the the things that a lot of war gamers take for granted mm -hmm. when you're talking so anyway you can kind of introduce them slowly to that that uh, rapport that war gamers have i guess we you know denver mentioned 65 and that came up in my talk with maurice fitzgerald the other day but 65 to me and you know that's mark that's why i first contacted you i was mm -hmm. always a little hesitant about the card games or the 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 card mechanic within war games but that has turned me into a super fan of them now and we mentioned about game companies taking risks on new ideas and i think we mentioned that you do that quite a bit and you're batting a thousand with it uh, what do you owe that success to luck um you play a lot of non-war games i would have to say and i feel like i feel like you get a lot of your ideas from something you play with us yes family. I'm, I'm looking off to the right here because there is some I want to mention. Ah, that's it. Um, okay. Uh, I don't know. I, uh, 65. Exploded. You know, I exploded. That's where you got. No. <laughs> no, well, that's where you got the Kursk ideas. Yes, in nine. Yes, it is. It is. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the Kursk, you know, Kursk is card assisted. And, uh, you know, you play artillery cards, all this kind of stuff in Kursk. Um, but you have, you know, the counters on the board. It's not like 65 where it's card driven. And, uh, but in Kursk, somebody can play a card, like they play an airstrike. And if you're the Soviet, you may have a card that says Nyet. Or if you're the German, you may have a card that says Nine. And that idea came from Exploding Kittens. I'm sure you guys have played Exploding Kittens, right? Come on. Oh, absolutely. My uh, my Minnesota group, we used to call it Splody Cats, and it was usually our <laughs> warm-up game. It's an amazing game, of course. Of course. <laughs> well, you know, actually, well, anyhow, to stick on subject, that's where that idea came from, was from the Exploding Kittens. But to answer your question about 65, you know, it probably came more than anything else from Combat Commander. To be honest with you, I, I like I like Combat Commander, and although I think 65 is an entirely different feel, I think the original inspiration probably came from Combat Commander. Your game 65 got me into Combat Commander, so once again, I I, uh, nice. I thank you for lowering my bank account. Ah, well, which, uh, um, which I don't mind at all. I'll show you something here. Let me back up, make sure there are no kittens under me. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of exploding kittens. Uh-oh. This is, can you see that? Yes. Okay, so you have that one, this one, and there, there are two more. So I, I, I'm going to shoot something out there. That looks very familiar to me. I think I've been there. That looks very what? Familiar to me. I think I've been there. <laughs> Phil, and I think you've been there too. <laughs> it definitely is bringing back some memories. And then these cards, if you all can see them, the end turns have been revised, so no one misses them now. Okay. But, uh, yeah, that's for 85 uh, Graveyard of Empires. So, I saw the hind profile, so. Yeah, so it's uh, the Soviets. And as you can see, I've also got all the counters in that, in that playtest bag, but I mean, it's pretty far along component-wise, but still, I mean, we, we still have a good number of scenarios to test. My goal was to have that out this year, but I swear to God, I can't get everything out I want to. Honest to God, I just run out of time. So, yeah. 
65 is alive and well and going to be getting more alive and well over the next 18 months. It's slowly become, uh, quickly became one of my favorite games. And it's slowly becoming one that I'm going to keep playing over and over again because the replayability is better than almost any other game I own. And Phil, I need to have you play that game with me. And I know we talked a while ago about 85. I didn't want to mention it because I'm very excited for, for that game for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, and as far as you thought you'd have it out this year, don't rush it. Uh, I think most of us here will buy it whenever it comes out. But the fact that your games come out and I'm not hit with an errata a week later, uh, to me, is something I enjoy about Flying Pig and Tiny Battles games that the, you know, you guys play through all of the problems that could be in the game. And that's why I, I personally enjoy them. Yeah, I, I, I definitely do as well. They're, they're smooth designs. But I wanted to I wanted to mention one game for a beginner game, and that's Swamp Devils from the Blood Bayou. I almost mentioned that too. All, Is that Tiny all Battles? Aside, tiny Battle, yes. Tiny Battle, Swamp Devils from Blood Bayou. It has a so cool and accessible combat system, which revolves around just you throw a number of chips into the cup, if I remember exactly correctly, and I've played it seven or eight times. You or I played it two or three I times. Played it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you throw a number of chips into this cup, depending on your combat factor and the color of your combat factor, and then you pull out a chip. And that could mean somebody's wounded. That could mean that you've actually been able to research one of the, uh, Swamp Devil monsters you're fighting, you've gotten a piece of flesh off of them or something. I'm, you know, I'm putting story behind it. I think it's so much fun. I think that that would be a, a, a good game for a starting war gamer. And of course, any of Herm's series, the uh, uh, Invaders, yeah, Invaders from Dimension X, Space Vermin from Beyond, or Attack of the 50 Foot Colossi. Uh, and I bet the reason Denver didn't go there immediately is the thing is they're all uh, they're all solitaire. Well, and I also think with like 65, I think the mechanism, the card pool mechanism, and having your options in front of you, or at least feeling that way for beginners, is really helpful. Instead of just looking at counters and being like, oh well, yeah, this guy can shoot. Oh no, wait, he can't shoot. Or you know, you that it feels kind of limitless. But when you have four four cards in front of you, and this one says fire, this one says move. Like, you know, you can fire and move. So I think it's a little bit more clear. That's why I feel like 65 is good for that. 60, it's a, it's a great game. So the Swamp Creatures, I'm putting it out of my cart. But one of the things I'm going to tell you, and, and hear me out, I don't like about you guys is that you guys make really good games and subjects that I never thought I would buy. And here I'm looking at, I never thought I'd, I'd, I'd buy a game on the Franco-Prussian War. But I'm looking at this game. And it looks that good. It does. Um, it, it, it looks like, and what I mean hate is, you know, I love spending, love spending money on you. Um, it, there's just something about the game and knowing the pedigree of your other games that just, to me, it, it sells itself. That game is coming out pretty soon. It's not out yet, I believe. It's still no, it is out. It is, is out. out. A, ma a matter of honor is out. It's okay. maybe two, two weeks ago, something like that. Pretty, pretty recently, yeah. You don't see too many games on, on the Franco-Prussian War. What, what made you say, two, well, two questions, what made you say, let's go ahead and green light a game on, on this conflict? And two, the mechanics look a little bit different than other games I play. Um, what kind of was the, the thing about this game that says, let's, let's do this? This is, looks like a great game. Well, the designer, uh, uh, Jacques Rebier, is he just, he did a uh, Dien Ben Phu game for um, oh, White Wolf? Not White Wolf. Anyhow, for somebody else. And I'd seen that game and I was very impressed with it. And he came to me with this game. 
and it looks super cool. It is um, a system similar to the Storm Over system, like Storm Over Arnhem, Storm Over Normandy, was it? Uh, so it's a simple, simple system that's similar to that. And he was such a pleasure to work with. That's one of the things. I love working with designers that just take the lead, will correct artists, um, just want to make sure everything is done right. And uh, that's, a, that's the way Jacques is. So it was all those things put together. Plus, I don't know if you know this, but Herm, uh, Herm is a huge uh, Franco-Prussian War fan. I think he did a game for GMT on it. And it uses the same system kind of as the devil to pay. I think it's, uh, it's always interesting to see games from unusual places or unusual aspects, uh, as well as to see fresh takes on, on very redone, um, redone portions. It sounds like that's really a core philosophy of what you guys are trying to do, because just about everything I see is either a new take on an old subject or a brand new take on a brand new subject. That absolutely is stuff we enjoy doing. Absolutely. I also enjoy traditional uh, hex encounter war games. We have one coming up from, uh, we have one coming up on, on D-Day and beyond is literally, I think what it's called. Uh, and it's pretty much a traditional hex encounter game. I still, I, I like those too. I think there's room for everything within the, the broader wargaming space. I mean, I could think of both traditional and, un, and unconventional games I've played and I've liked. Um, it's just a matter of making time and then again, who you can play it with. Uh, I've found hex encounters that are very accessible and I have found hex encounters that are not. Uh, trying to get my partner, Vicky, to look at some of the combat resolution tables I play, her eyes just glaze over and she's like, can we do literally anything else? So I definitely understand the struggle of you want a wide variety to appeal to a wide variety of potential players. So I'd like to go back to something that was said earlier, and I think it's worth bringing up again. Uh, most war games traditionally are for two players or maybe two teams, but they, they're functionally still two overarching players. It's just managed. Okay. Uh, it had been mentioned that when there's more players, sometimes it's easier to feel like it's, it's spread out or a little bit. Do you guys have plans for more multiplayer games of or more multiplayer war games on traditional topics like will there be uh, uh will there be if player expansions for existing games or more games coming out that play more than two um and the only other thing we would have is the dark horse skirmish right um yeah, I mean, the only thing we... Or law resistance systems. Right, what we have right now is just law res And I know you, that wasn't the question. I'm just trying... The short answer would be no. The long answer would be I absolutely would love to, and hopefully we will in the future. Uh, I, I think it's critically important. One of the things that holds war games from being mainstream is the fact that it's usually only two people and most of the time folks get together in a group to play games yeah that's that's absolutely true and that's one of the things that restricts me from getting a uh, games table with my group with like with the group i play dungeons and dragons with we have six people myself and five players nice. um so whenever we have a game night only on nights where almost everybody cancels or on an unusual night where my one friend who is very into war games and I just agree we're going to meet alone, uh, do I really get a lot of that stuff to table. But in doing so, you know, that's four other people that we can't really invite or involve. So mm -hmm. I, think it's a, I think it's a hard problem to solve and it's not one that's, that's anywhere near ready to solve. And I, I certainly don't mean to be mean to two-player war games. God knows my collection has more than a few. Uh, sure. And I enjoy them, but I'm always on the lookout for what else can we do for that. And that was definitely one of the things that grabbed me about La Resistance. Hey. Yeah, um, absolutely. La Resistance has up to five, and then we have a, uh, forget the name of it, but a, a game on Chile that Brian Train did for Tiny Battle that is up to four. 
And then, of course, the Dark War RPG and uh, Skirmish is an RPG, so pretty well almost unlimited. I would definitely like to have more uh, multiplayer games. Absolutely. Uh, Mitch, you were saying something? Okay, we may have lost Mitch on comms. I was going to say, it sounds like Mitch is saying static. Hello? Am I good? Yep, we got you now. Oh, sorry. I, Mark, you and I are the gray beards in this conversation where uh, Denver and Phil are a lot younger. So, really, I want to ask the both of you guys a question. In five years, where do you think our community is going to be? as far as types of games we're playing, what do you think is the next big thing to kind of widen the gaming audience? Um, you know, COVID really took a hit on face-to-face -face gaming for a while, but from talking to a lot of developers, they feel like, you know, this is going to spring back right away. But in five years, where do you see the, what innovations are going to be hitting our hobby that are really going to take it to the next level? It's a tough question. Denver? You have to answer. Yeah, I yeah, I'd love to hear from her. Sure, I have to think about it a little bit, but I guess stepping back and including my own interests outside of wargaming and kind of seeing tra uh, trends at cons and stuff, and from what I want, it applies to what you guys have been saying. But like, I'm so tired of getting. I I see a lot of the same themes in board games and I they all just kind of look the same like when I walk around convention halls I think like well I feel like I've seen the same theme you know done to different, 10 different ways and then I get the board game and it doesn't feel like it works you know and so like I keep finding myself being drawn to like abstract games um, that just work like simple games and the ironic thing is, is that like dad's games they just work and they're not simple but um, I think we need I think those companies that are designing games that might not work as well. Um, I think you're gonna see those fall out and we're gonna see more of these like, the ones that stand the test of time are gonna have to be play tested better. I mean, it just comes to play testing, I think. Um, and then I think we're gonna see a lot more online interfaces like Roll20 and different ways to enable us to be able to play, I guess, remotely. I think if COVID has shown us anything, I've been using Roll20 with some of my friends and we did tabletop simulator and I bet, I think we're going to see more into that, but that's all I can think of off the top of my head. Yeah, terrific. I think there's a lot to be said about distributed gaming for, for role-playing games and for tabletop games. I know there's a lot of firms out there uh, that use tabletop simulator now. You see mm -hmm. that they'll, they'll sell you a simple, a simple module for it or give it away for free if you beta it. And it, it's a little counterintuitive at first, but it's an interesting way to get a similar experience over the net. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and try to encourage some questions from the audience. We got quite a few people sitting out here. Uh, if you guys have any questions for Mark and Denver about what's going on with Flying Pigs or Tiny Battle, go for it. Otherwise, I'm going to take the opportunity to uh, keep asking my questions. So I'll start with one right now. Uh, something caught my attention during the La Resistance Kickstarter that was uh, one of the stretch goals. So Mark, I wanted to ask, why do Easy 8 Shermans hold a special place in your heart? Oh my gosh, You're, that is a, he's gonna love you now forever. I got him an Easy 8 uh, sticker for Father's Day. <laughs> oh man, that's his favorite tank, that's so funny. <laughs> and believe it or not, um, Phil is, was an army tanker for five years, so mm -hmm. he's a treadhead. Um, you know, it's just it's just funny. That's all. No, it's, it's not. You know where it's from. Do I? I thought it was Fury. Well, that's no Fury. I liked him before <laughs> Fury. Uh, of course, Fury, the tank Fury, was an easy eight, as you guys probably know. Um, you know, I think part of it was a tongue-in-cheek comeback or push back against all these companies that put German panzers on their company, on their, uh, the cover of their boxes and all the war gamers that, you know, want to play with the German tanks and stuff. And so, so part of it was push back against that good natured pushback, I would even say part of it, 
was all kind of tied with this whole idea that, you know, maybe we weren't given the American GI enough credit in World War II that maybe by late 1944, the best tankers in Western Europe were wearing olive drab and not field gray. And so I just started pushing all this when you see these, you know, a German Panther and people going, isn't it a beautiful tank? I used to always go, uh, it's not as good as an easy eight. And then that confuses the heck out of people. Yeah. People will be like, are you serious? Do you know what you're talking yes. about? <laughs> yeah. Or, or when they say, you know, have the tiger and talk about how terrible it was. I mean, how, you know, how potent it was. I would say, well, not as e not as potent as an easy eight. <laughs> And so I guess it was kind of, kind of just a running joke. Well, it, it, so it's one I appreciate. Having come up in that same world, what I found is that the the more folks I talk to that have uh, tactical or operational experience with tanks, none of them like the high end German stuff because it had too many maintenance problems and too many weird supply problems. And you know, especially if you're going with something that's using an unusual gun later in the war or unusual ammo, it's just hard to supply. And you know, I think of the Battle of the Bulge where you had two divisions of SS Panzer more or less grounded dust by the Americans, mostly by artillery, unfortunately, not my brothers in tanks. But it definitely goes a long way to prove that you're absolutely right. They're not invincible and they're highly overstated. So if that's your entire emphasis for, uh, for, for amping up the EZ-8, I'm going to go ahead and copy that from you and start doing the same thing because I'm with you. I, I don't like hearing the, uh, the unstoppable power of German armor. That's, that's annoying. You know, my it's neighbors. The story of the underdog. It's, yeah, uh, underdog. Yeah. I, I, I think we should be pushing that we start up production on easy eights again. Uh, I agree. They're hey, cheap parade tanks. Yeah. I my, mean, how much did an easy eight cost? Probably like $30,000. What does an Abrams cost? A lot more. 35000 No. Yeah, but then, then you get into the, the big. I won't go down too on this. It's uh, it's always there's an obsession uh, ever since the '80s with survival, because all of our mid Cold War tanks, you know, the M48 and whatnot, the, these are good systems. But as more and more ATGMs get developed, they're just way too vulnerable. So all the money and the big cost gap that goes from the M48 slash M60 up to the up to either the M60 ERA or the the Abrams with the Chobham armor, that's what it's for. It's fear of ATGMs. But that's topic for another time. So well, we got a question. lives is a good thing to put money into. Oh, absolutely. Um, so we do have a question from Robert Deming. Uh, he asks for advice for new designers. Mm. Um, well, the, the biggest device, device, yeah, I'm okay. The biggest advice I could give you is um, design from your heart and just design a game that you want to play and damn the torpedoes. You want it more specific than that? And then start playing as quickly as you can. I don't think you can get any more specific. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I interviewed Sid Meier once. Most people know who that is. And uh, he said that he believes one of his tricks to good design is, of course, we're talking computer games with uh, Sid Meier, but is that he gets a playable prototype as quickly as possible. And I also agree with that. You don't know how much fun something is so you're actually pushing the counters around on a map. And then you can start tweaking from there. And I could go on forever and say, don't get discouraged. Sometimes you get a design and it comes together pretty quickly. That's the way lock and load was for me. But some designs take forever and constant tweaking for a long time to make them good. Just stick with it. I bet none of that stuff really helped. Oh, no, that's all used. I mean, I think it's useful advice as somebody I do defense war game design for the government, and we certainly have to deal with with similar problems. So no, I think I think it's solid advice. So one thing I'd like to bring up is a recurring theme over the few days of cyber wars that we've had. Uh, we've had a couple people on in different ways have talked about things that are under-gamed or over-gamed or what would you like to see. Oh, yesterday, yeah. yesterday uh, Professor Sebastian Bay, who runs the Georgetown University Wargaming Society, he mentioned that if he had all the time in the world right now, 
or if somebody else would do this, he would really like to see a game on the Imjin War, which was the Japanese invasion of Korea in the late 1500s. Is there any particular topic that you'd really like to see gamed? That's a scary stare. Um, <laughs> now you asked me, is there any particular topic I would like to see gamed? So something that isn't avail are you asking me hey mark is there something that really isn't out there now that you would love to see or are you saying mark what is your favorite era for gaming so i was really asking for is there something that's not available yet that you'd love to see but i'd also like to hear about your favorite era yeah me too <laughs> um well my favorite era is is modern it just it just is uh and what I really love is is getting peanut butter and chocolate. I, you know, I uh, what I would love to see is a game that just mixes horror and gritty, realistic war together in one game. Okay, so combination of of horror and a broader war game. So that appeals to me. This is something I wasn't even sure I was going to get to talk about today. One of my favorite tabletop uh, role-playing games is Arc Dream Publishing's Delta Green, which is a, uh, it's a, it's sort of a military horror conspiracy horror game. Very, very brutal rules. But in order to make it more accessible, um, they, they, they streamline the combat, which I like. But I had always thought, how could I take something like this and apply it to something very, very gritty? Like one of my favorite scenarios in that game was a, a scenario where I had players as soldiers that were in Afghanistan um, investigating an unusual local tribe that had some bizarre practices. And they go in to clear this building and the room clearing goes almost perfect until they realize the third thing they're shooting at is not human. And the calculus just changed immensely. And like the way I saw the look on their faces when, you know, well, I, I hit it with a 249. It does nothing. It does what now? Like it was just amazing watching the players react to that. So I agree with you. I think that'd be really cool to nice. see in a game. Yeah. All right. So uh, from the comments, we do have a few other things. So Rich offers not just for game designers, but you, for learning a new game, you got to push the counters. Uh, I agree with that. And that makes me think of another question. So, one of the things we've talked about today is with a lot of the games we talked about, they're designed to be replayed. They're designed to be getting, gotten to table again and again and again. How many times do you expect or do you hope somebody to play a game you sell to them? Well, I don't know. I've never thought of that. I'm happy. Um, I'm just happy if they play it in this day and age. You know, we're all, um, we're all the same way. Denver a little bit less. She, she plays almost everything she buys, but I bet you- I have look, a storage unit with games you haven't seen. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't know, looking around my uh, office and the games on the wall, if you discount the ones that I've had a hand in their development or produ production or publication, um, I probably only played about 60% of the games I own so I'm just happy if somebody actually plays a game that I sell. And if they play a game and then they uh, write me or post that they really enjoyed it, that gets me super amped up. And if they post something like, I've been having some trouble and I found that this was a great escape for me, it pretty much makes my month if not my whole year awesome absolutely so one other thing to touch on that talking about what games we do play what are your guys favorite games you're playing right now it can be your own design somebody else's whatever you want to talk about well we just finished uh undaunted normandy we played every scenario, played every scenario. yeah i, I saw that online yeah david thompson's a brilliant designer we really liked it and now we're playing um africa we're only two scenarios in. I think we lost a little steam because we were pretty determined. We've been playing a lot of Azul. That's been one of my favorite games lately. 
Um, I think it's just like the perfect game. It's just so balanced. Nothing ever goes wrong. And Greg and I have been testing the Long Road and Aiden, which is Aiden, A-D-E-N, uh, which is almost like Armageddon War Light. It'll come out from Tiny Battle. Um, Trogdor, the board game. We've played Trogdor, Trogdor the, board the board game, game lately. Solid. But it, Great. Um, High school me was really excited when it came out. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, a game I played that I enjoyed, oddly enough, uh, was French Foreign Legion Paratrooper. It was maybe the last issue or the issue before last from a uh, modern war magazine uh from uh decision games have you yeah. all heard of that yeah he had a it was a couple of uh paratrooper battles right in one pack no so, it was more than that it was better than that it was a solitaire game and what you did was excuse me joe miranda designed it you uh followed like a year of uh, being in command of the paratroopers and there would be different random uh, problems that would arise like a weapon of mass destruction, a kidnapping, a rebel takeover, and they had all these small maps and you would randomly roll up the map that you would have to go to. You would have to allocate resources from a fixed amount of resources get people on the ground like you know you could get paratroopers on the ground quickly but if you wanted to get light armor that would take longer because uh you'd have to get it there by ship or plane or something but i really enjoyed that game well terrific to hear you know, so and i'm also playing full the gap from compass games uh i'm not sure i understand it yet <laughs> I Have definitely picked up a it? couple titles like that. I haven't I haven't played Fulda. Um from Compass, the one I enjoy the most actually came out a few years ago, which is their South China Sea, uh John Gorkowski design. And they're supposed oh. to be coming out to us with a sequel to it for um the Indo Pacific as a whole, where they'll introduce India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, a couple others. It's an interesting game. You, you know, Mark, you mentioned the Fulda Gap game. I almost picked it up. Um I wanted to hear some first person reviews on it. It just seemed that different. And I, there's so many games that cover that subject matter. I was interested to hear what they did differently, so I'm still waiting. But Well, you know, it's the CSS, uh, which is their company something system, which is based on the GTS, which is based on uh, whatever. It was like a 70s game that Eric Lee Smith designed. Um, it's a complex system. I mean, it, you're, you're going to have to work at it to be able to play it. That's, that's all I got. Good. <laughs> I made up my mind on that one. <laughs> okay, so we are getting to about the last five minutes. So one thing, uh, one thing we want to give you guys a chance to highlight is some time to talk about what do you have coming up later this year, early next year? What's in the pipeline? What should we get excited about from Flying Pig and Tiny Battle? And where we could find you. Right. Um, you know, I would like to like to give you five minutes of hype, but I'm not going to. Uh, I don't know what we're going to have coming out. Now, that sounds terrible. That isn't it. We have so much stuff, uh, and it takes so long to do it that I will tell you what we will have coming out soon. And that will be a strategy guide for 65, the first expansion for 65, uh, Graveyard of Empires, 85, Graveyard of Empires. So all that's in the squad battle system. Uh, I hope that by this time next year, we will have volume four of Old School Tactical out. We will have the long road out way, way sooner. Uh, matter of fact, the long road will be our next Kickstarter. And then we have a big game from uh, Herm uh, that will cover the entire battle of Gettysburg with the Devils to Pay system. Um, two gargantuan mounted maps, the whole nine yards. It's going to be 
a huge, huge deal. So, um, so I'm supposed to interview Herm in a few weeks. Right. Can I ask him to spill that one, or you can ask him about it? I mean, he'll basically yeah. tell you what I just told you. Right. Uh, we've got we've got the map for it done. We've got a lot of the play testing for it done. Uh, we're still working on the counters and stuff. Um, so that's that. That's flying pig. And the reason I, I I can't say well in March we have this or in in August we have this. It gets ready when it gets ready. We work hard on it. We get it done as quickly as possible. But we're just not going to try to be one of those companies that puts out two games a month. So that's us. Every game uh, you mentioned, I plan to buy. Well, I hope so. I mean, every <laughs> game, every game I mention, I'm super excited to play. So, uh, and then with Tiny Battle, what we have coming up is that D-Day game. I said we have uh, Black Horse coming out from uh, Regio. Uh, we also have Aiden coming out from Greg Porter, and we have Solus coming out from Greg Porter, and that, that'll take us through the end of this year. Um, I'm very excited about most of those designs, and if you could please pass on to Arigio, um really, really, really like Lion and Malaya. Like, that was, he took, a, he took something that, that doesn't get gamed a lot, and the way he gamed it was simultaneously familiar and fresh. I was telling people the other day, uh, what I really liked was the way he did air power, degrading fatigue rather than full attrition of, of those units. To me, it was a much better way to represent, especially non-precision munition air power like they had in World War II. So really like that. I will absolutely tell him that. That'll mean a lot to him. Actually, that game came up in quite a few of the chats, I believe, with uh, Maurice Fitzgerald, and I believe in yours, too, um, on Friday night, Phil. So oh, I will I try to... It. Yeah, I will try to pull out some of the snippets where our other speakers have talked about your games. And um, since that's what gets you going, uh, you're going to really, really like to hear what a lot of these guys have to say. Was, I just uh, want to see him enjoy it. Now, I'm surprised you guys could get along with Mo. You know he's a Marine, right? Yeah, I do. So yeah. here's the thing. If we would have had him here, we would have had all four services other than Space Force represented. So <laughs> Phil was Army, Air Force, your Navy. Yep. That's true. That's yeah. true. And you rarely, and it starts like a joke, you know, an airman, a Marine, a soldier, and a sailor. Yeah. We're, we're uh, on the Zoom channel. So. Nice. All right. Well, on behalf of NoDiceNoGlory.com and HMGS, thank you so much for giving us some time today. Really appreciate talking with you. Very excited to hear about everything you got going on, everything coming out. So this has been a production of Cyber Wars, and until next time. Okay, thank you guys a lot.